To begin again, uh, I'm Randall Pinkston, and it is my honor to welcome you to the 15th annual Ippies Awards. It is, as most of you know, the only awards program that recognizes excellence in New York's independent ethnic and community media sector. This is, yes. This is the uh, fourth year that I have been invited to be your MC at the Ippies. It's always a treat to be here. I love to sample the foods. I love to sample the foods. <laughs> and I look forward to the dessert. <laughs> and of course, to meet new friends, to meet new colleagues, to hear the many languages spoken, and to mingle with journalists of so many nationalities and all in this wonderful international city of New York. Uh, some of you may know that in a previous life, I worked for CBS News, and in that capacity, I traveled and reported around the world. Um, but it's always struck me, even as I was visiting those foreign shores, that if you live in New York City, you really don't have to leave here to learn how people from around the globe think about events in their countries or, for that matter, in this city. Now, if you joined us last year, you may recall that New York City Councilman Carlos Menchaca was unable to join us at the last minute. Uh, Menchaca, but Controller Scott Stringer graciously delivered the keynote. Well, this year, I'm happy to report that Carlos Menchaca, uh, pardon me for the mispronunciation of your name, sir, I'll get it straight before this is over, uh, is indeed the key speaker. So welcome, Carlos, but before, before he speaks, the Dean of the School of Journalism, Sarah Bartlett, would like to offer her own words of welcome to all of you, Dean Bartlett. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming to what I think for all of us is one of the happiest nights of the year. Um, one of the people in the room told me earlier that this is his favorite award ceremony of the entire year, and he goes to a lot of them, so I take that as a great tribute. Um, this is, as, as Randall said, our 15th year, uh, well, the existence of the Ippies is 15 years old, and if Juana Ponce de Leon is in the room, can she wave? There, is she, there she is. Juana... This was really her brainchild um, 15 years ago, and it, and it started in a different uh, organization and in a different life, but it's been our privilege here at the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism to have it here for the last six years. And uh, I wanted to thank the uh, members of the advisory board of the Center for Community and Ethnic Media, some of whom are here tonight. And I also wanted to thank the uh, donors and supporters of this evening's event, which includes Con Edison, 32BJ, SEIU, FJC, Metro Plus Health Plan, Fox News, the David and Catherine Moore Family Foundation, the Open Society Foundations, and the New York State Nurses Association. I would also like to thank the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment for their very generous $1 million donation to support training for the community and ethnic media. We could all clap for that. In addition to their support, we, we want to also recognize the long, longtime supporters of the center um, and the J School, the Charles H. Revson Foundation, the Carney Corpora Carnegie Corporation of New York, and News Corp. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand it back to Randall. Thank you for coming. Uh, Uh, thank you, Dean Bartlett. And before we proceed, I should tell you that our speaker is a bit delayed. He is coming. Some of you may have heard about a situation that occurred today, a tragic situation in Manhattan, Midtown. Um, that has caused, in addition to the deaths and the serious injuries, um, tremendous traffic problems uh, throughout the city, not just in Manhattan, but throughout the five boroughs. So anyone trying to move around on the streets, um, having a bit of difficulty. 
And of course, since I mentioned that, we will extend sympathies to the uh, families of those who were killed and injured today. Um, so to proceed now, um, let us now bring forward the co-directors of the Center for Community and Ethnic Media, Karen Pinar and Jahangir Katak, to tell you a bit about the center. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Randall. Thanks, Sarah. Um, this is the sixth year that the IPPI is so named because they're awarded to members of the independent press, not the mainstream media, have been sponsored by the Center for Community and Ethnic Media at the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism. The IPPIs are given to work done during calendar year 2016 and produced by some of the more than 300 media outlets that play a pivotal role in the city's discourse. It's become a commonplace these days, since November 7, to be precise, to say now more than ever before about so many things. But that truism bears repeating. Now, more than ever before, the work done by these media outlets is vitally important. From food cart owners to nurses, from taxi drivers to construction workers, from artists to activists, three million foreign-born residents of the city not only make it work, but make it thrive. Their stories are not often told, even today, even when Donald Trump's anti-immigrant and anti-Muslim stances have spurred more coverage in the mainstream media. It still falls largely to the community and ethnic media to tell their stories, to track how immigrant entrepreneurs are staking out new businesses in the Bronx, how voter registration and civic engagement are growing in ethnic enclaves in Queens, and how gentrification and affordable housing affect neighborhoods in Brooklyn. And it often falls to community and ethnic media to take a full accounting of hate crimes or discrimination that members of their community suffer. Community and ethnic journalists take the pulse of immigrant and minority neighborhoods throughout the city every day, telling us how people live their lives in these stressful and changing times. That's why we each year celebrate the, work, the journalists who do that work. Now we'd like to tell you a little bit about our work. Jahangir. Greetings, everyone. I am happy to be here and happy to share news of the center with all of you. Since we gathered last year, a lot has happened at the center. At the end of June last year, the New York City Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment gave a million dollars to CUNY Graduate School of Journalism, which will be spent over five years to bring digital skills to the community and ethnic media in the city. The CCAM Media Toolkit is designed by CUNY J+, the professional development arm of the school. J+, is run by the charming and dynamic Marie Gillo. Marie, ably assisted by Luciana Pearson, has helped us to develop a terrific curriculum. We started off classes in October with two hands-on workshops in our new Made in NY broadcast studios. Over the past few months, the digital, uh, the media toolkit classes have covered everything from using the latest social media tools to 360 video to podcasting and have drawn 150 attendees. Also over the past year, we started a new health reporting fellowship and ran our business reporting fellowship for a second time. And we took our training activities on the road, offering research tips with Barbara Gray, associate professor and chief librarian at the J School to journalists at LaGuardia College. And we have continued to draw community and ethnic media to our newsmakers briefings, which over the past year featured Human Resources Commissioner Steve Banks, Department of Consumer Affairs Commissioner Lorelei Salles, Department of Cultural Affairs Commissioner Tom Finkelpearl, and Small Business Services Chief Greg Bishop. The newsmakers' briefings are hosted by NY1's Errol Lewis, who runs the urban reporting program at the J School. 
At each of these events, two journalists from the ethnic press joined Earl to uh, ask questions from our guests. We also hold special sessions periodically. Last year, we worked with the New York State officials to unveil their nat new Naturalize New York program and with the White House Initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders to present a briefing on getting Asians to take better advantage of the DACA program. And we moved quickly to present one of the first post-election panels to discuss immigrant protections and rights. Finally, at our flagship site, Voices of New York, we continue to feature the excellent work of the community and ethnic press, supplemented by stories original to the site, written by students here at the J School and freelancers. The biggest news last year was the presidential campaign and election, of course, and we tracked what that meant for immigrants and minority communities. Opposition to Trump was far from universal in immigrant communities, and we tried to reflect the variety of views in our coverage. We also followed efforts to promote civic engagement across different communities, looking at get out the vote efforts by the Council on American Islamic Relations and similar efforts in the Dominican community and in the Korean and wider Asian communities of Flushing. And a powerful multimedia report by one of our freelancers, J School grad Melissa Noel, won a coveted award from the International Labor Organization. If you don't know who barrel children are, or what they and their parents have experienced, you should read Melissa's story, which touches on wrenching issues of separation that in fact affect many immigrant parents and children, not just members of the Caribbean community she tracks so closely. We've carried a series of stories, videos, and audio reports on ways the health department and others are trying to address health disparities in the city. Less serious topics continue to get coverage on our site as well, as we run stories about cultural events like the work of artists to commemorate the now extinct neighborhood known as Little Syria, or profile restaurateurs like the Nepali chef who recently brought her renowned cuisine to Lexington Avenue. The stories on health, Little Syria, and the Nepali restaurant, incidentally, were all produced by recent grads or current students at the CUNY J School. Before continuing with the program, we would like to thank a few people. In particular, this year, I would like to single out for special thanks IT Senior Associate Faniel Javarias, who did a truly amazing job in designing a wonderful new IPI submission tool for CCEM. It made submitting, judging, and tracking the entries a great deal easier. We would also like to thank Jennifer Chang, our associate editor, who does an extraordinary job helping to edit Voices of New York and plan the IPIs. Gogi Padilla and Jennifer Dale did a super job with all the arrangements. We also had help this year from our Korean intern, Man Young Cho. <clears throat> Finally, we couldn't put on such a large event without the support and expertise of Alistair Wallace, the J School's manager of equipment and AV services. And with the J School still in session, it took a lot of effort on the part of Pam Drayton, our Director of Public Safety and Facilities, to figure out the logistics and make it all happen. Thanks, too, to Public Safety Officers Romel Butcher, Frandy Germain, and Pauline Floyd, who look out for us and our guests. Thanks and an apology to all the J School students we've displaced by holding this event while school is still in session. Thank you all. Thank you. So we are going to alter our program slightly. We will begin with the awards presentations, but uh, when the councilman arrives, uh, we will interrupt that and hear his remarks. So this is the moment you've all been waiting for. Time to award the Ippies for the best work produced in 2016 by the community and ethnic press in the New York City area. We are awarding prizes in 10 categories this year. Now, helping me to announce the winners will be Tom Robbins, who teaches investigative reporting. Yes, come up, Mr. Robbins, take a bow, at the CUNY J School. Uh, he was the lead judge for the Ippies investigative category. As you know, Professor Robbins is an award-winning journalist himself. 
most recently for the groundbreaking work he did on prisoner abuse and criminal justice issues. So very important. Congratulations, sir. Each IPI's category was reviewed by two or three judges drawn from the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism faculty and professional journalists. You can see the list of judges at the back of your program. However, I just saw the councilman enter the building. So, yes. <laughs> so, we will uh, hold the award presentation in abeyance and welcome our keynote speaker. When Councilman Carlos Menchaca, is that the co correct pronunciation? Okay, I just, Menchaca, okay, I just want to make sure. When Councilman Carlos Menchaca was elected in 2013 to the New York City Council to represent Brooklyn's District 38, which includes Sunset Park, Red Hook, Greenwood Heights, and parts of Diker Heights, Borough Park, and Windsor Terrace, but not Prospect, where I used to live, anyway. He was making history. He became New York State's first Mexican-American elected official and Brooklyn's first openly gay office holder. Menchaca has proven to be a fierce advocate for minority and immigrant rights and an activist for social justice. He has rallied with car wash workers and fought for tenants' rights. He has authored and co-sponsored literally dozens of bills, including the law that introduced New York's Municipal Identification Card, IDNYC, which today is held by more than one million residents. He has embraced New York City's sanctuary movement and led negotiations to fund the city's largest public defender program for undocumented immigrants. He was one of the pioneers in participatory budgeting in his district. And no small matter to us, he last year held hearings on the importance of community and ethnic media, hearings at which the Center for Community and Ethnic Media testified. You can read more about his accomplishments in the program, but right now, let's hear more from the councilman himself. Please welcome Councilman Carlos Menchaca. Buenas noches. How are we doing today? I, uh, I love that I heard multiple la uh, language responses to that, by the way. <laughs> uh, I am so happy to be in front of you today for so many different reasons. Um, but probably the most uh, important one is the relationship that we're going to have and celebrate, not just in the past, but in our very immediate future. I represent a very, uh, very diverse community, as you heard, and that work that we do in the city council every day, not just as a chair of the immigration committee, this is the work that every city council member has to do. We can't do that without you, which is why it's important that I'm here today at the 15th annual uh, IPPES Awards to really thank you and CUNY uh, to continue to do this good work. The diversity that I represent uh, is not just in language, it's in practice. Uh, I am, yes, I'm a Mexican-American, uh, I'm gay, I, I wear my boots uh, that I bought in college, uh, I don't have a TV. Uh, I'm trying to think of giving you a sense of just like, this is, this is who we are, we're evolving as a people. Uh, and I, I, I'm right there in the middle. Uh, I don't own a, own a car. I, I am subject to the MTA and its woes, uh, and, and that's, that's, that's who I am. This profile of a people is, is just so important to the work that both you do as journalists and we do as elected officials and representing. So you know that I represent a, a massive Chinese community, a Latino community, a Muslim community, borough, parts of Borough Park as well. I don't know if you mentioned that. Uh, and that isn't easy. The roots that each of these families, each of these family leave in our community and grow every day really requires one very basic thing, and that's information. The information that people get is so critical, but not just any information, accurate information. And so much of what we have to do, again, as, uh, as community members, as journalists and as government is make sure that we're doing that in tandem and really supporting each other in that effort. And I, 
I, I have to I have to kind of give a shout out to some of that are very special tonight. Uh, George and his team at the Red Hook Star Review. Uh, let's give them some love right now. <laughs> The relationship that we've had over time uh, has, has been up and down, left and right, in and out. Uh, but again, this is part of what we do to push each other to make the best case for good information. And not just to tell the story, but to tell the story that's going to inspire people to want to learn more. Because in my community, we have urgent needs. Housing issues, displacement, jobs, legal aid immigration assistance, access to education, health services. These are the daily things and the daily grind that show up at my door or when I'm on the street. Now, in these respective roles that we take, we have to figure out how to uh, push ourselves. And, and, uh, and I wanna just kind of lay out two bit very basic things. It's not just the basic theme of ethnicity or language access, it's also one of locality and timing and consistency and building relationships. At a time when social media and the electronic publishing world that has hit us all uh, in different ways, whether you're a giant or not, um, this constant hyper, kind of hyper requirement for hyper local and instant information, New Yorkers need journalists and outlets that can keep with the pace of people's lives without losing the depth and the accuracy. And that, I see that, we lose that so much. You know, I was walking across 7th Avenue and there were no cars. And I'm thinking, uh, you know, should I, I'm gonna jaywalk right now. And then I realized, oh my God, I, I had to spend so much time on my feed, on my news feed, talking to, or hearing about the car crash. And I, and I really hope everyone's okay. I think the, the, the reports I'm seeing right now are, are that one, um, one person has lost their life and 20 some have, have been injured. And, and I just wanna take a moment, not only just to, to be with those that were injured and the, pos and the death, but also just to understand this is how we get information. In the middle of my meetings and in, in, in transit, I have more relationship with the headline than I do with even who wrote the headline. And that, that, is, that is a, an, as a piece of information and a piece of understanding that we really need to, to need to focus on. That I'm I'm kind of going through news feeds often, and just the headline itself is my the intimacy that I have with information. That could be dangerous. It's also well known that people who are comfortable with large media sources look to the local and the ethnic media for information and the topics. But we have to ask that ask that we have to ask that question. Are we building the actual relationship as journalists? Are we building those actual relationships as elected officials? And so this year, we're confronted with the federal administration, 45, and his harmful policies uh, that continue to target our people, our immigrants, our Muslims, and our undocumented uh, immigrants, and, our, and, um, and the LGBT people. And people are scared. There's a, there's a wary for in misinformation uh, and propaganda uh, and this is, the, this is the, the world that we're living in in so many different ways. When the executive order banned uh, Muslims, Muslim travelers coming to the United States, a spontaneous and massive protest formed at JFK. How many people were there that day? Raise your hand. Awesome, There's somebody in the back over there. Thank you. How many of you heard about that day? Raise your hand. Everybody. So these are the kind of things that are that are that are just so, so critical for us because as we cover these stories, it's so important to figure out what's actually happening. And I remember being there. I was the first council member on the scene, and I remember relaying information back with the people's mic uh, in the crowd. And I, I saw a lot of journalists there thinking and and figuring out what what's actually happening here when information was just coming out in drips and drags when the count the Congress members were inside fighting for the families. And again, then I became a, a vehicle for information. We are, and just today, I left a big meeting on broken windows policing and how, how intense those conversations can be for us. And for us as the listeners who are representing the people, it's hard not to be engaged in a way that is personal um, and, and engaging in, in information that comes out after the meeting. And this is our responsibility, our collective responsibility. How do we take that information that is so charged 
and bring it back to the masses so they can be charged in a way that is inspiring. These are the things that we all think about together. And finally, what I want to say in the Sanctuary City work that I know we're going to keep doing together, the, the now over a year ago where we had the first ever, the first, first ever uh, public hearing on ethnic and local media, a lot of you came out to testify. Can I, can I get a raise of hands again? Who came and testified that day? Awesome. Thank you. There were a couple, there are a few here. That, was, that changed the game on the administration side like I, I, I've never seen before. That changed the game inside of the city council with the speaker's office doing a lot of work internally with her administration. And that's going to continue to change the game and chip away at that barrier and that gap of relationship that we have with our administration. And I have to say, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. The kind of funding that is going out to our local, local and ethnic media outlets uh, hasn't really grown the way that I think we all want it to go. Uh, and just need to know that I'm going to be continue to fight, uh, not just with the speaker, but get more council members to keep fighting for you. And the last thing I want to say, um, as, we keep, as we keep our commitment, uh, the achievements that, that are going to be celebrated tonight uh, are, are not only important achievements, but they're achievements that continue to define who we are as, as a people. Um, so it's right to lift up those that are doing the good work on the ground, uh, be it land use, uh, be it housing issues. And so a lot of you have to create, and I'm with you on this, expertise that you never had the day before. And with that, that's where I think government can be helpful in making sure that you have all the tools you need as journalists to get the right information. And so that's my commitment to you today as a council member, as a chair of the Immigration Committee, and just as a New Yorker. Because at the end of the day, I really do feel, and I keep coming back to, this idea that, the, that democracy at the end of the day is at stake here in so many different ways. And both journalism and the world of journalists, government and the world of elected officials, we're all, and with our community, we're all lifting this community, and it is not, or we're all lifting democracy, and it is not easy. And so I keep saying over and over again that while it is not easy, we all have to lift that together, and that burden is our burden. And so the Ippies Award really offers us that opportunity to lift and celebrate, but know that the hard work is ahead of us. And so thank you for inviting me today. I want to continue to build great relationships with all of you, and again, to the Red Hook Star Review and everyone, Kimberly and George. You are all here today to be celebrated, and I can't thank you enough for what you do in our community in Red Hook and beyond. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Oh, no, no. I don't want to. Oh, want to oh okay, fine. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Terrific. Oh, yes. Oh, one more. One more. All right, fine. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, sir. Wonderful. Another round of applause for Councilman Tucker. So, yes, Mr. Robbins, if you would, please, sir. Um, so let's just repeat the uh, rules that have been established. Each IPI's category was reviewed by two or three judges drawn from the CUNY Journalism School faculty and professional journalists. You can see the list of judges on the back of your program. The judging panels worked independently of each other, and the winners are known to only a handful of people in this room. So, judges, would you please stand? Judges, please stand. Judges, please stand. Oh, there's uh, one. Come, come on, on. Come, come on. on. Now, stay, stay, stay up, stay up, stay up, stay up, because we want to applaud you while you're standing. <laughs> We have shy judges, hmm. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your hard work in selecting the finalists. A uh, few brief instructions for the winners. When you hear your names, please come to the podium to receive your awards. In order to keep the program moving along at a fairly decent clip, we ask that you refrain from taking photographs during the presentation. After the awards, official photographs will be taken in the research center, that's over there. And these photos will be shared online tomorrow. You are all welcome to take your own photographs in the Research Center as well. Now, with that, Mr. Robbins, if you would, sir, come and get started with the first.
five award categories of the evening. Thank you. So I second that emotion that came from uh, one of our erudite uh, members that Sarah cited that this is the best single award ceremony in New York. There's no question about it. You know, I, it's, I can tell you, I go to some of these highfalutin places where they hand them out like Cracker Jacks prizes in a box, you know, and like people, oh yeah, I won an award, big deal. You know, here in this room, it's a big deal, right, when you win this. So we, we don't have enough plaques for everybody. I'm sorry about that. But this, the work that is put together year by year that I get a chance to judge, I can tell you, it gets better and better all the time. Uh, the work that uh, the center does, that Voices of New York does, bringing all these voices out and getting all of you together in a room like this is, continues to be, I think, one of the best single things that happens in this very wonderful school of journalism here. So I, I'll second a little bit of what Councilman Menchak has said, that like, you know, the work that we're looking at doing in the coming future, uh, it's going to get even more real than it is now. I mean, there is a, a real storm coming our way. You know, there's no question that uh, there's a lot of folks here in New York that will do their best to like hold back the tide, but that tide, uh, that tide is going to hit us, and it's going to hit us hard, and it's going to hit us in the neighborhoods. It's going to be you're going to see programs that right now that count for a lot for families and neighbors. Uh, you're going to see uh, less jobs. You're going to see a lot of changes in health care. You're going to see some really massive on the ground changes, and the folks who are going to be covering that won't be our you know, illustrious neighbor here on the corner of the New York Times. It's not, you know, it's not going to be the Washington Post. It's not going to be the Wall Street Journal. As great a job as they're doing, and they are doing a great job right now chasing down what's going on in the White House and Congress, they're not going to get out in our neighborhoods and like, try to explain what's happening, what that is being uh, the message that's getting out of Congress and the White House right now. That's going to be our job. So. Let's talk about what we got this year. The first award category is the one that uh, means the most to me. It's the investigative, uh, uh, investigative category. And not all investigative articles need to focus on problems or wrongdoers. Sometimes they can take the reporter and the readers to a wonderful, unexplored place. And that's what happened when the forward reporter, Alan Jalon, decided to follow up on an intriguing story that he heard from an elderly filmmaker and Holocaust survivor who lived on Manhattan's Upper West Side about how the late, great Paul Newman had directed a short film called On the Harmfulness of Tobacco. This exhaustively reported and excellently told story is what editors call a bright, meaning it's one of those stories that doesn't bring you down like all the other things that we have in the news. <laughs> and it's one of the rarest journalistic accomplishments. Third place goes to Alan Jalon and the forward for Paul Newman's lost masterpiece and how he discovered it, rediscovered it. New York is generally a noisy place. And how to make that subject into a good news story is a tough sell, both to editors and reporters, not to mention to readers. But this reporter did just that, taking a long, hard look at what his North Bronx neighbors say about the urban war around them. And he found that while police and other authorities rarely respond to citizen complaints, some residents cite a din loud enough, as one long-suffering Bronxite put it in the story, to raise the dead in Woodlawn Cemetery. In a vivid and comprehensive story that included statistics and explanations from law enforcement and officials about why they can't do anything about noise problems and how they're so tough to fix, the Norwood News demonstrated that no story is too basic to tell. Second place for best investigative and in-depth story goes to David Cruz of Norwood News for Noise in Norwood and Beyond. Congratulations, David. Local news outlets 
usually greet the arrival of a new precinct commander, police precinct commander, with welcoming words and a soft touch. After all, the new chief can either help or frustrate reporters chasing important stories. But when the city named a new CEO for the 68th precinct in Brooklyn, as considered, by the way, one of Brooklyn's choicest posts, the Brooklyner dug into his past, tracing the numerous times he'd been accused of misconduct, detailing the hefty sums the city has made to settle cases against him. The Brooklyner also told his readers and showed the picture of how the new police captain had become, quote, the face of violent police response to Occupy Wall Street when he was photographed aiming his baton at a protester's head during the demonstrations. That gutsy news coverage in troubling allegations follow Bay Ridge's new top cop wins Rachel Silberstein writing in Brooklyn her first place this year. Rachel? The second category is for best story about a community. The third place winner is a haunting account of the legacy of the infamous golden venture, Smuggling Ring, and its Chinese mastermind. It's a story, it means a lot to me because I was right there at the Daily News when my friend Ying Chan was running down big sister Ping and getting her life threatened. Ying used to have to have literally a police escort around Chinatown for a while. And one of her great protégés is reporter Rao Xiao Ching of the Tsingtao Daily, and she wins third place award for her story. Wrong? Polish community in the Hudson Valley tries to hold on to its culture and traditions in the face of economic and demographic changes. For this heartfelt portrayal of a community in flux in the church at its center, to save a piece of Poland in the Hudson Valley, Alexandra Slabish of Novidzianek wins second place. Alexandra. <laughs> Strong research and reporting, the judges for this category said, give the reader a vivid and varied account of the challenges gay men and lesbians faced in Russia and the lives they live now in New York. Denis Chiridov of Forum Daily, the Russian language online site, wins first place for Russian-speaking gays and lesbians get a fresh start. we had the best social issue story. This is a good social issue. A garbage-strewn vacant lot in Brooklyn becomes a festering health hazard as efforts to turn the eyesore into a community garden get buried under mounds of trash. Can the 16th Street zombie lot rise from the dead? <laughs> she won a prize just for the headline. Forget about the story. It's a story of a decade of blight along with resources for residents eager to take action. Third place in the social issues category goes to Carly Miller in Brooklyner. I'd like to point out that they left a couple of vowels out of Brooklyn, but, but I, you know, I still could figure out how to pronounce it because I'm a crack investigative reporter. <laughs> what exactly constitutes affordable housing? With impressively thorough research and detail, Abigail Savage Lou offers evidence in city limits suggesting that the poorest New Yorkers face a far more serious housing crisis than their middle class neighbors. Second place goes to Do New York City's Middle Class Families Really Need Affordable Housing? by Abigail Savage Lou in City Limits.
That's not Abigail, but that's all right. She does a good imitation. That's our own, that's another CUNY J School grad doing good. A parent is arrested for daring to question a Brooklyn teacher who refused to let his seven-year-old son use the restroom. Then, tensions between Midwood's Public School 193 and the community led to the threatened arrest of another parent and the eventual ouster of the principal. The story, elementary school principal removed following outcry over father's arrest by Alex Ellison in Brooklyner wins the first prize for best social issues story. Well, they're running the table here. Congratulations again. And now for the fourth category, the best small circulation publication. It's only the third year that we've had an IPI awarded in this category. But as in previous years, the competition is stiff. For many of these publications, doing their best means making do with little in way of resources. It's remarkable what a fine product many of them are able to put out. This publication has been covering and serving its community since 1971, first as a daily and since January 2016 as a weekly. The change seems to have sharpened its coverage of social, cultural, and political issues of importance to the Polish community and it's a must read for many in the community. Their piece, Polish American Churches in Their Communities, provided readers with a detailed, comprehensive look at the important role the Catholic Church plays in sustaining the community and how the churches are adapting as many Polish Americans move from Greenpoint to other neighborhoods in the New York area. Third place goes to Nowy Zienek and Nick Sadowski. This feisty little bi-weekly produces an impressive variety of original stories with just one full-time staffer. The February 4th to 17th, 2016 issue featured a front page story on the New York Botanical Gardens efforts to develop a property it owns, a human interest piece about a Bronx car dealer that donated a van to a pastor whose vehicle was stolen, and a report on a school that has benefited from nutrition education programs. The issue also provided a story with an incisive look into the political machinations holding up construction of an ice skating rink in that marvelous empty armory in Kingsbridge. Norwood News and editor David Cruz garnered second place in the small circulation category. Congratulations again, David. I'm not reading this. We know Brooklyn is a happening place. <laughs> December 2016 issue of this publication informed readers about two new developments being proposed, explored how police are being trained in Navajo peacekeeping methods, reported on the opening of a college and career readiness center, and explored the likely impact of Donald Trump's election on the neighborhood. Just as useful were listings of community happenings, church service hours, Religious news and news short. The community of Red Hook is lucky to have this local resource. First place for small circulation publication goes to George Fiala and the Red Hook Star Review. What a great name. And now for the best editorial and commentary. Following the election of Donald Trump in November, there's been a spike in hate crimes around the country. In hate in the time of Trump, New York Amsterdam News editor Eleanor Tatum argues passionately and eloquently that we all must pay attention. Third place for best editorial commentary goes to Eleanor Tatum. Why didn't see tonight? Oh, good. She's not here. I can tell a story on her. All right. I knew her when she was this small. Uh, okay. 
why we told them not to take pictures. Of it. <laughs> the trial of Peter Liang, the Chinese-American rookie cop whose bullet ricocheted off a stairwell wall, killing African-American Akai Gurley, got extensive press in 2016. In political expedience and the Liang trial, solid reporting and writing offers important details, the judges said, about exactly how different politicians across the city responded. Second place in the editorial commentary category goes to Stephen Witt of Kings County Politics. While some Jewish organizations have acknowledged the Turkish genocide of Armenians in 1915, the vast majority of American Jewish organizations still don't have a policy on the issue, this editorial states. In why Jews need to recognize the Armenian genocide once and for all, which appeared first in Yiddish in the Yiddish forwards and later in English in the forward, Jordan Kutzik makes an important and well-researched case. The judges concur concurred with the words that accompany the submission. The piece has particular resonance since it was written in Yiddish, the native language of the vast majority of Jews murdered in the Holocaust, and was first published in a newspaper whose readership includes a sizable number of Holocaust survivors. First prize in the editorial commentary category goes to Yiddish forward and Jordan Kutzik. All right, I'm done here. Hey, Randall, you want to come back and announce the uh, winners for the rest of the evening? Thank you. And thank you. So, our next category, best overall design of a print publication. Easy on the eyes, vibrant and well-structured throughout with excellent use of grids and clear hierarchy of types. This publication is very readable. Since I'm not a print person, I have no idea what clear hierarchy of types means, but you guys do, and it's a wonderful thing. The judges award third place to Onur Aydemir and the monthly Turkish language publication, Forum USA. The print publication is well organized, easy to read, and has a striking cover. The inside pages, too, are easy to read with typography, spacing, and use of color that accents certain sections. Elaine Tenyol, Anya Yulinich, and Kurt Hoffman of the Forward win second place for the best print publication design. Our judges loved the imaginative displays of photos and data, vibrant layouts, strong topography, and great attention to detail. Even text-heavy pages are clean and well-organized. First place for the best design of a print publication goes to Minyu Liu and Lili of Epic Times. Our next category is best overall design of an online publication. This site had a straightforward design with strong visual interest and clear hierarchy on its home page. The judges also gave the site kudos for its headline treatment and ease of reading. Michael Conforti and Christopher Wodrowski win third place for the online design of Long Island Press. Congratulations. All right. Okay, yeah, why not? <laughs> the judges said they had a strong first impression on viewing this site's homepage, which makes good use of varied image size, varied image size to establish strong story importance and incorporates a lively trending now scroll. In addition, the judges found the site used a spare navigation effectively and praised the smart application of color and labeling. 
Second prize for best overall design of an online publication goes to Liana Zagare at Brooklyner. Best overall design of an online publication is our next category. Oh, I'm sorry, I've done that one, excuse me. Oops. This is what happens when you print on both sides of the page. Okay. Um. Oh, of course. Best photograph. No, no, no. You no? did not give the first prize. I didn't get the first prize? Yes. First prize winner is a site that is strongly visual. Obviously, my script is not. I printed it. It's my fault. The judges said, well organized with an effective color scheme, strong topography, and a powerful focus on fostering social conversation. The judges especially appreciated its attention to detail from the messaging of its logo to its winking navigation animation. First place for the best overall design of an online publication goes to Victoria Butenko at the Russian language online site Forum Daily. You take that one. Okay. And then it accepts. Congratulations. Okay. Okay. Now, next category, right? Okay. Now, best photograph. Each of our judges is a working photographer as well as an instructor here at the J School. They reported that it was a pleasure to see such strong work from so many community photographers and their publications. For this photograph, the photographer uses a super wide angle lens to demonstrate the size of the crowd that turned out to show support for Peter Liang, the NYPD officer who fired the bullet in a dark stairwell that killed the unarmed Akai Gurley. Ching Wei Shu of World Journal wins third place for justice for Peter Leon. <laughs> this emotionally charged image captures the anguish of tenants in Chinatown in response to rising rent and its impact on the community. Second place goes to Kei Shu of Tsingtao Daily for Chinatown Tenants Fight Eviction. And now, first place. This energized image illustrates a community with flair, near perfect timing, and an unusual angle of view for showing off school pride at St. Anne's, which appeared in Norwood News. First place goes to Adi Talwar. And now we come to the popular category of best video. Using sparse narration and the combination of video and photos, this simple and to the point video report illustrates the emotional and legal issues surrounding police shootings in the US. Justice for Peter Liang by Sheng Wei Xu in World Journal wins third place in the video category. Welcome back.全美四十个城市连线发起二二零挺洋示威。纽约市的近六万人在布鲁伦Catman Plaza Park集会。Well done, sir. A much-needed reminder of the country's past and its struggle with race and diversity is in this video, 
The Freedom Riders 1961, paintings by Charlotte Jansen, well shot and produced by Justin Bryant, wins second place for Brick TV. Justin Bryant. By the late 19th century, segregation of blacks and whites had become an entrenched way of life in the South. In December 1960, another Supreme Court ruling declared segregated restrooms, restaurants, and waiting rooms for interstate bus, train, and plane passengers unconstitutional. Five months later, that law would be severely tested by Freedom Riders. My name is... This provocative video adds new faces and voices to the dialogue around diversity, race, and inclusion, or the lack of it in New York City's public schools. Seeing Myself, produced by Rachel Salazar at Brick TV, wins first place. Woo! Come on back, Rachel Salazar. Now, last year, we may remember that we did not have enough entries to award prizes for the best multimedia package. That was last year. This year, we did receive enough entries. Photos and an audio report present the views and concerns of young immigrants in the wake of the election of Donald J. Trump. For Between Fear and Hope, Young Immigrants in Post-Election America, John Rudolph and Rachel Bongiorno of Feet and Two Worlds receives third prize. A number of videos, a map, and other graphics provide many elements of the story of NYPD rookie cop Peter Leong. For their report, No Jail Time for Peter Leong, What About the Donations? In Sinovision, reporters Dan Chi Wu and Yi Yi Wang receive second place in the multimedia category. A written story, photographs, and 360 video tell this compelling story about the increasing health but persistent inaccessibility of New York City's waterways. First place in the multimedia category goes to cleaner creeks and bays, but how will New Yorkers access the waters they own, which appeared in City Limits, the story produced by Guglielmo Mattioli and Adi Talwar. Okay, that's it for me, but there's one more award, the Voices of New York Award. And for that presentation, please welcome back to the stage, Karen Pinar. Thanks, Randall. Um, I know everyone's eager to get dessert and celebrate the winners, so I'll try to be brief. Um, I also want to mention, which I didn't, we didn't mention in our earlier remarks, that uh, first prize winners get, uh, do get some money for first prizes, and uh, we are distributing just under $10,000 to first prize winners with tonight. So, okay. Um, so, I am here to award the Voices of New York Award, which comes with a check of $500 for the winner, 
to single out a member of the community and ethnic press who we believe has done extraordinary work. Shortly after I became editor of Voices of New York three and a half years ago, one of our translators suggested translating a story about how Asian students at Stuyvesant High School were suffering under severe stress and how disinclined many of them were because of cultural taboos to seek out counseling help. Sounds interesting, I said. It's really long, she said, about 8,000 words. Oh dear, better cut it way back, I said. 4,000, she suggested. No, even less, I said, more like 2,000. Okay, I'll try, she said. The translation came in pretty much at the length we'd agreed. Then I saw the byline, and much to my surprise, it was the translator herself. I was a little mortified that I'd unknowingly asked the writer herself to take a meat cleaver to her own story. It was a terrific story, even in its highly condensed state. It went on to get really good readership among non-Chinese readers, as well as, of course, the Chinese readers of the far longer edition that ran in Singtown Daily. And the story had a nice half-life, too. Last year, we noticed a spike in readership of the translation that had run on Voices. Ever since that occasion, every time Rong Xiaocheng has pitched a story of her own, I've been happy to run the translation for Voices of New York, because whatever subject Rong reports on, she does a spectacular job. She's been covering the Chinese community in Chinatown, in Flushing, on Long Island, and elsewhere for more than a decade. And her reporting skills and sensitivity to her subjects, whether they are young Chinese American students, Fujianese workers, or wealthy EB5 visa holders, shines through in the detail and nuance in her stories. This year, in addition to doing a bang up job covering the elections and the Peter Lang trial, she authored a very long report for which she just won the award earlier this evening, Sister Ping's Legacy, based on dozens of interviews here and in China. Um, so, what I'd like to say is that it is with great pleasure that I'm awarding the Voices of New York Award to Rong Xiaoqing. I just want to say something, and this is an award, uh, it's Voices of New York, Karen gave it to me, uh, but I feel this should be an award that we gave to them, Karen, Jahangi, and Jennifer at the CCEM. Um, for the past few weeks, these people worked crazily to make tonight happen, and also to update the website of Voices to showcase our stories, and also to Sarah uh, of CUNY J School, uh, you guys have provided us so much help and support through the years. Uh, we don't have the award, but uh, at least we can give you a warm round of applause. Very nice, very nice. And why don't you all give yourselves a round of applause for your participation in community and ethnic media. Well, that wraps it up, folks. Congratulations to all of the winners. My apologies for missing that first place winner for a minute. Thank you for catching me up on that. Wouldn't want to leave you without that first place winner in the money. Mm. Um, you can gather for photos right across the way there in the research center. And everyone is welcome to join us for dessert in the reception area where we gathered earlier in the evening. Again, thank you for coming to the 14th annual Ippies Awards presentation. And good night.